the live on Facebook at the same time. This is being launched. Okay, great. Well, I see that we have many attendees. That's a pleasure to see so many of you. So, as you know, this, uh, as you might know or not, this uh, webinar will be recorded. So, for the for the trolls who like to send some funny messages, you know, we're going to keep this. This kind of data will be kept for us. Uh, now that you know that I'm launching the recording and we're going to start the webinar in a few seconds. This and that's it. So good afternoon, everybody. So as I said, it's a pleasure to have as many of you today uh, to see. First of all, that's a pleasure and kind of a surprise to see that we have so many people interested in <laughs> data protection. I didn't know that our job was so fascinating. <laughs> um, so as you know, today I have the pleasure to welcome you to the webinar organized by Elsa Belgium in collaboration with IP News on the subject of how to deal with GDPR as an association. But before uh, going through the presentation and uh, presenting you the subject, I would like to introduce you Axel Belen, who is our partner today and who's going to be presenting with me. Axel, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Victor, and good afternoon, everyone. I would like to, first of all, thank you to uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about one of my uh, favorite subjects being uh, GDPR. Uh, I am Axel Bill and I'm responsible for uh, my uh, electronic platform called uh, IP News. IP News consists of uh, a website, also uh, LinkedIn and Instagram, because you have to be on Instagram nowadays, and a Twitter account. I'm uh, dealing with uh, GDPR since a few, uh, a few years. I'm a legal consultant and I'm working uh, now in a big uh, insurance company for uh, assignment for a few months, uh, uh, always in the field of the, of the GDPR. And that's it for, for me and let's take uh -huh. the, the talk. Well, actually that was a very humble presentation because what Axel doesn't say is that he's one of the most specialized people in data protection Thank you. in Belgium. He's been writing one of the most famous book on the matter that he's going to be presenting at the end of this uh, presentation. So uh, a, a great expert in the matter. From my side, I cannot say that I have such an impressive CV, but I am currently the data protection officer of Elsa Belgium. Uh, to introduce a little bit about myself, uh, I have been working in the associative world for three years now, being first a president of a local association, then entering into ELSA uh, in the Department of International Traineeships, the STEP program, and now being the Data Protection Officer of ELSA Belgium. For those of you who might not know, ELSA is uh, the European Law Students Association, the biggest law students association in the world, present in 44 countries, and we organize several uh, programs, several activities for students one of them being, as I said, our international traineeship program. And today, mixing uh, in, uh, Axel's incredible skills in data protection and my experience in the associative world, we would like to tell you and to teach you, to talk to you about how to deal with GDPR as an association. Because today, everybody knows about GDPR and data is everywhere. Uh, as, we, as we hear all the time, we, went, we enter the world of data economy. So nothing can be done without data which explains why we created this whole new fra uh, legislative framework, the General Dat uh, Data Protection Regulation. Uh, but uh, as you know, it applies to everybody, but lots of people do not know how to apply it concretely and simply. And lots of, lot of people think it's a very complicated and very complex instrument. They don't really understand how to deal with it, especially small structures like associations. And this is the idea behind this whole webinar. We would like to explain in simple and concrete words how to ensure your compliance as an association, may it be ELSA or any other kind of association. Okay, so I think maybe we can jump right in. So when it comes to presentation, we're going to start with a small introduction about GDPR, data protection in general. Then we're going to follow the whole process of the life of data. So from collection, 
going to the obligation arise that we have as collectors of data, as processors of data, and then to how to keep the data, which means also how to stop keeping the data, deleting, anonymizing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Finally, we'll be talking about some special topical questions, and Axel will be presenting a general data protection governance framework. Okay, so if everyone is ready, are you ready, Axel? Yeah. Let's okay, let's start then. So I'll let you the floor for the introduction. Yeah. Uh, the first point is to deal is to ask what is the, 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 the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. As I, as I wrote, it's not really a revolution in, uh, in Europe. It's more uh, an evolution. Why? Because we have a, a long history of data protection regulation in, in Europe. It's coming from a, a directive in, uh, from 95 which was replaced so by this uh, regulation in uh, 2016, uh, regulation uh, that entered into force on the 25th of May of 2018. It's a now uh, a regulation. It's a, a big difference with a, a directive. A regulation is directly applicable in all the member states, in all its terms. For a directive, you have to implement the directive in all the member states. So we had uh, before the regulation uh, 28, 20, no, 28 uh, different national uh, implementation the directive of uh, 95. So it was uh, very complex. It was uh, very difficult to understand for big companies dealing with uh, that uh, with personal data, uh, with uh, cross-border data processing. That's why the European Commission in 2012 uh, wanted to have you now a, a regulation. But it's, it's a, not really a, a normal regulation, the GDPR, because you have, a, okay, it's applicable in all its terms, but it allows also the different member states uh, to uh, implement the GDPR uh, in their national uh, legislation for example when you are talking about uh, children uh, in the gdpr it allows the the member states to choose between 13 and 16 years old that's why you can have a lot of difference in the member states so 50 50 uh, possibilities that you could find in the gdpr so pay attention it's not a pure regulation uh, in french i call it a reglective a mix between a uh, regulation and a directive. So pay attention also to that. And we are living, as uh, Peter said, in a digital world, a big data digital world. Data is uh, the oil of the digital uh, economy. So it's very important for companies nowadays to uh, for their business. The, uh, let's think about Google. Google is only dealing with your personal data is making, uh, I think, a lot of money from that. Um, and uh, what I wanted also to highlight from the beginning is uh, the importance to have a good security environment around the personal data, because we hear and we can read uh, days after days and there are uh, data personal data breaches from uh, the newspapers to uh, to also Facebook, the Cambridge Analytica, it's a data breach just because it is an unwanted uh, processing of your personal data. In Europe, we have a structure in which the Court of Justice of the European Union only her as the final word of all the inter interpretation on all the European legislation. So don't forget also to watch, to read their uh, ruling uh, uh, regulation or uh, rulings about uh, the, the GDPR and also about the previous directive. We have no rulings about the GDPR. It's too soon. Maybe it will be in five or uh, six years, but we have still a lot about the previous uh, directive. And what the court said about the, the directive could be applicable for the GDPR, for the explanation of the GDPR. It's not very, uh, a clear book. It's not a, a novel. It's a, it's a regulation. It's not so uh, easy to read. 
So don't forget also to to consult, to read, to be uh, yeah, to go to the website of the European Data Protection Board. They issue uh, guidelines about uh, several uh, expressions, several uh, topics that you could find in the GDPR. Okay, thank you very much. And so once this has been presented, one question that you might have is, okay, this is very good, this is very interesting, but I'm just a small association. Why should I focus about that? Of course, this is the law. I, uh, I mean, everybody has to respect the law, but who's going to look at me? Why? I mean, there, there is no reason. There is uh, no, there never will uh, data protection authority come to my small association and have a look at that. So why should I focus on that? Well, of course, I mean, the first, the primary reason why you should focus on that, as I, as I mentioned, was is legality and the fear of financial consequences, which can be very important because financial consequences are calculated on your turnover, which means that whatever is whatever your size is, you can be put in danger if you if you if if you realize big breach of the GDPR and you you, you are facing some important fines. So this is, of course, the, the primary reason. However, trying to think a little bit out of the box a bit further, because actually when you are uh, entering your compliance, when you are showing uh, GDPR compliance, when you are protecting data, what you are creating is trust. You are actually showing trust, and not only to the one you deal the data of, because of course uh, your, your clients basically, may, may them be students, may them be private people, are going to be interested and are going to trust you since they know that you take care of your data. But this goes beyond that. This is way, this goes further than that. Because what you do is also increasing your uh, credibility and your reputability, especially for low students association. What would we look like is as low students, we did not ensure our compliance. I mean, you would be dealing with partners who know about the GDPR, uh, with lawyers or consultants or whatever, who know about that and you want to look serious, of course, and then when they're going to ask you the, this basic question, oh, how do you deal with your data? You're going to say, I don't know. I have nothing that's foreseen. How, how do you look like? You lose all your credibility. So this is also a very good reason why you should focus on that. Because actually, when you deal with GDPR, when you ensure your compliance, this data protection compliance you had to focus so much about from a burden will become a strength. Because this is going to differentiate you on the market. You're going to look more serious. So it's going to be way easier for you to deal with your clients, with your partners. As an association, especially as a student's association, you're going to look uh, way more reputable to the professors, partners, members as well. You might have uh, members who are implicated in the low world. You never know. And so this is why I think it's extremely important to focus on this compliance, not only because it's the law, not only because everybody talks about that, but for very concrete reasons that make that your compliance can become a strength, especially in a world like uh, ours as low students and low students association. Uh, so let us start the presentation itself. Axel, I give you the floor back. Thank you. Uh, here we are uh, going deep, deeper uh, in the in the subject of the of the GDPR. So GDPR is a complex uh, complex text. It's uh, well, more than uh, hundred articles. So the, first of all, you have to ask by yourself. Yeah, I'm dealing with with data. But what is a personal uh, data? Personal data has a very broad interpretation following the, the GDPR. It's everything that can be uh, directly or indirectly linked to, to an ident identifiable person. So you see it's, it's very, very, very large. And uh, the GDPR and the difference with the previous directive could be now applicable to a lot more uh, companies uh, association and public institutions. For example, the, the GDPR is applicable to every company that are located in Europe, and which is uh, a companies that are dealing with personal data. But it's also now applicable to the famous uh, GAFAM. Previously, it, it, we have to, uh, to assess if the GAFAM, Google, uh, Facebook, and so on, had a kind of uh, administrative center dealing with personal data in Europe. Now, the GDPR is 
clear if the Google, Facebook offers good of services to European citizen, they fall under the GDPR. But also, if they monitor the behavior of a European citizen, they fall under the GDPR. So it's, you see that the, the broad the territorial scope of the GDPR is very, very large. In reaction to this uh, extraterritoriality scope of the GDPR, uh, USA uh, voted the Cloud Act. Uh, it was uh, one of the first uh, big uh, legislation done by uh, Trump in, uh, in the field of the personal data. What is the Cloud Act? It allows uh, the US judicial authorities to have uh, access to uh, data that have been stored by US uh, companies. Whatever the data is stored in the US, but also if the data is stored elsewhere, it could be also so in Europe. I think uh, if it is the case, uh, if a data is stored by Microsoft, uh, subject to the Cloud Act because it is a US based uh, company, and Microsoft stored the data in Europe. It could be a data uh, from a US citizen. Uh, Microsoft, in that case, or it could be also Amazon for AWS, the cloud uh, business of Amazon. Microsoft or uh, AWS will be subject to a kind of conflict of jurisdiction, of law jurisdiction. The Cloud Act is very, uh, very uh, not very famous uh, regulation, but it will be the case from, from the years to come because US will try to also have an extraterritoriality scope of the Cloud Act with the help of a national agreement. They had the first one with the UK at the end of the 2019. So think about the Cloud Act because it will uh, give you a burden, a lot, another burden for companies if they uh, work with US suppliers. Think about the cloud based companies, but also. Uh, current IT companies, they will have to assess if this company could be subject to the to the cloud plant. It will be a, it will be have an impact of what will be uh, highlight later the mandatory DPIAs, data protection impact assessment. And as Victor said, we have to see the GDPR not as a burden, but as a global positive value proposition for a company or for an association because it will be it will give trust to uh, to the client to the members and they will trust a lot more of your company if you are uh, gdpr uh, compliant if you are beginning your gdpr compliant journey okay so uh, i would like to rebound something that was said by axel and that is very central and important a data can be anything like it's a very broad it's a very broad notion a data is anything that makes somebody recognizable that uh, once again this can really be anything why do i say this because very often what i hear from association is oh actually you know the gdpr was made mainly you know for google amazon apple whatever i'm not concerned i don't deal with that much data and this is where the mistake is because as you can see on the following slide uh, you are dealing with a lot of data and nearly everything that you're going to do is going to be data related. There is going to be a collection and a processing of data behind. Because what, did we, what we didn't say yet is also a processing of data is anything. A processing is basically anything you do with the data, nearly anything you can do with it. So just to give you a, a couple of examples, a data can be, of course, a name, just a bank account, signatures, IDs, even personal preferences or allergies. Anytime you're going to have to deal with it, you're going to be under the GDPR because those are data that make people recognizable. And then when are you actually dealing with those data? What kind of processings do you do to make it clearer? Here are a few examples of processing that associations very often deal with. Of course, register of members where you have, let's say, a name, surname, the date of birth, uh, uh, email addresses, num phone numbers, sometimes the physical addresses, but also invoices. When you make invoices, you're going to have 
the bank account number of the person when you have the list of the participants to an event. And then I'm not going to go through uh, all of this, but indeed, like mailing lists are also an example. And the two last points are very important. Information about speakers or contact details of partners. Because very often when you're going to think of data, that's also another mistake that I can see. You're going to think, okay, those are the data of my clients, so the attendees to my events, of the uh, members that I have. But actually, this also concerns the data you might have from your partners or speakers, because you might have the personal phone number of one of your speakers, and then you're dealing with the data. So actually, just take a second to think about that. Like, think again about your association, how you deal with it, how, like, what is your daily life in your association. Just take everything you organize and think about that honestly, and you will see the huge amount of data you deal with. This is really huge, and this justifies, this, this is why you have to focus on that, because you actually deal with a lot of data. Nothing you can do today can be done without data, and therefore, this is why your compliance, once again, is central in the strategy of your association. Now, let's now move on to next point, which is uh, rights and obligations. Thank you, Victor. Yeah, no, we know what uh, personal data is. We know what uh, data processing is. It's very, very broad under the, the GDPR. So you act like that you are either a data controller or a data processor. A data controller determines the means and the purpose of uh, data processing. And a data processor uh, behaves under the name of the data controller. Both of these uh, people have obligation under the GDPR. It was not the case before for the data processor under the previous directive of 95. Now, both have obligations. You see here uh, an example of their uh, obligation. They have to, um, yeah, you can go to the, they have to think if they have to appoint a data protection uh, officer, it's not mandatory in all uh, in all the case. But if your company, if your association uh, process um, personal data regularly and at a large scale, you have to appoint a data protection officer. Also, if you are a public institution you have to appoint a data protection officer. And also, if you deal with what do the GDPR call particular kind of personal data. Particular, particular kind of personal data are what was being called in the directive sensitive data. Health, think about the health data, the trade unions data, that are sensitive personal data. And if you are dealing with that kind of personal data, you have also to appoint a data protection officer. If it is not mandatory for you to appoint a data protection officer, nothing uh, object you to, to appoint, nevertheless, a data protection officer. You will uh, do it for your company, for your association, question issues related to the personal data regulation. It will be also the contact point with the data subject, the people from who you collect the personal data and also for the data protection uh, authorities. The, the GPO could be uh, someone from your company, an internal GPO, but it could also be an external GPO, uh, an independent at your point as your GPO. Um, the GPO has to be appointed for your company, it has to have a deep knowledge of the, of the regulation, of the legislation. And you have to have, you will have to have the, the, all the possibilities to do, do his job correctly. And here I have to, I would like to, I would like to, to highlight one uh, ruling that has been uh, given by our uh, national data protection authorities at the end of April. So it's very uh, recent one. Uh, the DPA in Belgium fined the company for uh, 50, thousands of euro, it was the highest fine of the, the DPA. Why? Because appointed DPO of the company, it was a telecom company, was also the manager of the audit risk 
and compliance departments of the company. So it means that this person was not really independent. He has a conflict of interest between the two functions in the in the company. He was in the business, but he has also to supervise the, big, the business, to give advice to the business. So we see that uh, he has he had a conflict of interest, and so the company has been fined for five uh, for uh, 50, uh, 50 thousands of euros. So think about that. Another obligation for uh, data controller and for the data processor is to have a record of all their uh, data processing activities. Again, this record is not mandatory in all the uh, you know, case, but first, as a consultant as in this uh, matter, I strongly advise companies and uh, associations to have one because they will give them the opportunity to have a clear overview of everything they do with their personal data. And it is mandatory for company above if they have more than 250 employees. For companies who have less than 250 uh, euros, like for example, an association like Elsa, it is mandatory for them if they process the personal, if they do processing, that could bring a risk to the freedom and liberties, to the freedom and risk, to the right and freedom of the data subject. So if there is a risk, uh, uh, if they do with their uh, data processing, they will have to appoint, a, uh, they will have to have a record of the data processing activities. And uh, it's not very difficult to do that, to have a clear record of the data processing activities. It's simple, it's just a, an Excel sheet. Take an Excel sheet of eight columns, and you have, for example, to, to, uh, to inform, to put in this Excel sheet, the name of the data controller, the name of the DPO. You have also to put what is the purpose of the data processing activities. You have also to add, what kind of security measures you have put in place around the data processing, the personal data. So it's very easy to have a, sim a simple and a comprehensible record. And this record, you don't have to give it to the data subject, but you have to give it to the data processing, data, uh, the DPA, Data Protection Authority, if the, the authority asks for it. It would be a, a proof of your accountability. The fact that you, could, that you can prove at any time that you follow the rules of the GDPR. I previously mentioned uh, the fact that in some cases, if the your data processing could bring a, a risk, a high risk to the right and freedom to the data subject, you have to do what we call the DPIA, Data Protection Impact Assessment. In this assessment, you try to understand, firstly, your processing. You are also to describe the security measures that you put around the personal data in your company. And thirdly, as it is the most important part, you have to assess the, the risk. What, what could, what can, uh, what can we, can, what can we do to uh, decrease the risk? Have we put enough measures around the risk? And what, what could be the impact of the risk if this potential risk happens? And don't, uh, don't forget that you have to put in you, you have to think about the data subject, not about the company, but about the data subject. And to help you to do a correct and complete and full DPIA, I advise you to go to the website of the CNIL. This is the French Data Protection Authority. They, uh, they published uh, some years ago, a very complete, a very, uh, very easy to do DPIA. And also this DPIA will be a proof of your accountability towards the Data Protection Authority. 
we'll talk also about that later, but you have to inform your uh, public what kind of data you collect from them, for what reasons, for how long you will keep that data. And everything about that will be written in what we call a, a policy notice. And this policy notice has to be uh, put on your website, on every form that, that you have. And on your website, for example, at the bottom of your website, on every page that we can have on your website. Uh, we like also to highlight that when you are working with uh, suppliers, data processors, you have to write with them what we call a data protection agreement. In this uh, data protection agreement, you have to have the information from your data uh, processor, what kind of IT security measure you will have, how you will deal, how will help you to deal with uh, the question of the data subject and so on and so on. The kind of uh, information that we have to put in DPAs, you can find all the list in Article 28 of the GDPR. And finally, it can happen, but I, I don't know, I don't know how that it will happen, but maybe uh, a data breach can happen for your company, for your association. In that case, remember that you have to inform, to notify the data protection authority in a strict timeline of time, 72 hours. In 72 hours, beginning uh, from the moment that you are aware of the data breach, you will have to notify the data protection authority about this uh, data breach and also if it is a data breach that could bring a high risk to the data subject, we have also to notify them. It could be done um, publicly, collectively, or individually in some uh, occasions. And here is the, is the moment to, uh, to highlight the fact that don't forget your uh, compliant journey. Don't forget to put also to, uh, to ask in some uh, occasion the help of the national uh, protection authorities. For example, in the DPIs, if you cannot decrease sufficiently the risk for the data subject, you have to ask uh, the help of the national uh, protection authorities. Don't forget to do that, because if they are aware of, of the fact uh, after, you will be uh, in breach of the, of the GDPR. And don't forget about uh, the fine and the high uh, level of, uh, of fine that would be for uh, uh, four percent of the nation of the worldwide turnover of the company. Good advice. That um, that comes to the fact about the right of the data subject. Also, you have obligations for the data controller, but also as a data subject, you have rights towards the company that collect and process your personal data. This right uh, previously existed under the, the directive of, uh, of 95, but they have been seriously improved under the GDPR. You have uh, uh, more or less eight rights as a data subject. You have to have the right to be correctly and fully informed about what will be done with your data by the data uh, controller. We have also the right to have an, uh, an access of your personal data and a copy of them. Don't forget about that because the right to access include also the right to have a copy of your uh, personal data. Uh, let's say that you have now a copy of your personal data. You check them and you see that they are not correct. You have, to, you have the right to to ask for a rectification of the of your personal data that have been uh, stored and collected by the data controller. We have also the right to withdraw your consent. You will talk, we will talk about the consent uh, a little bit more later, but don't forget that you have, when you give the consent for the processing, you have also the right to withdraw easily your consent. You have also the right to object to specific uh, 
data processing, in other right to object without justification to any kind of uh, direct marketing processing, but also the right to object to other kinds of data processing. We have also the right to object to uh, automated, purely automated processing. This is a very uh, sensitive uh, uh, right. Um, a lot of articles has been written about this, uh, this not so easily understandable uh, right. But it's very important to know about it. Uh, we have also the right to ask uh, from to the data controller to be forgotten from uh, from him. This is the famous right to erasure that has been included in the GDPR following the famous uh, Google uh, Spain ruling from the Court of Justice of 2014. In this uh, ruling, it was uh, asked by Google to uh, erase uh, hyperlink to, to erase a result that you can find in a in a Google after a search on in the Google search options. This right has been included now uh, in the in the G, in the GDPR, but under specific condition. Other people say that it is uh, less. Pro less uh, in a more in a less positively way than previously, but it exists. And the last right that I wanted to to talk about is the right to data portability. Uh, this right, if you want to change from uh, one social media to another social media, without having to rewrite all your personal data. You can ask, uh, for example, uh, uh, Google or uh, Facebook to give your personal data, to bring your personal data to another social uh, media, to Google Plus. But now Google Plus doesn't exist anymore. So uh, the right to data portability is the last one that uh, we have under the, the GDPR. All these the right of uh described under the gdpr are subject to specific uh, condition each time uh, imagine that uh, you uh you have been aware that uh, data controller is in breach with your personal data you can bring the case you can bring a claim towards your uh, data protection uh, authority towards a national data protection authority, or you have uh, the choice to go directly in front of the judge. It is not mandatory to go uh, firstly uh, towards on your DPA and after uh, towards the, the judge. And if I may uh, react on this, this is even one of the reasons why it's so important to ensure your compliance, because indeed, maybe you may be such a small association, that it's very unlikely that your data protection authority will focus on you. But this does not protect you from the data subjects, from the people you deal the data of, to to sue you in courts, and then you still might have some, uh, some some uh, fine to some fines to pay. You still have to do, you you still open yourself to a lot of risks. Uh, so once again, it's not because of your size that you should not uh, focus on data protection. You still open yourselves to risks. So yeah, that that was what I wanted to add uh, on this point. Yeah, it's a, it's a, everything is about a, a good risk assessment. And uh, if you are if you are in breach, the sanction could be very high. I say it was uh, it could be to four percent of the worldwide turn, uh, turnovers. It's a lot more than uh, than before in Belgium. Uh, previously, under the, the directive on 1995 uh, on GPA, the Commission de la Vie Privée previously had no power at all to find uh, a data controller and in france they have the they, ha they had the power but with a very very limited uh, amount now it's uh, remember that in uh, in france the biggest the highest fine was uh, in january of last year it was against google it was uh, 50 uh, millions of euro it could, could be uh, much higher uh, in the year to come so don't forget about your compliance and don't be in front of the paper. Okay, so this might seem like a lot of things to handle, 
And your, your, your next question is probably, how do I do this? Well, what I would like to present to you is what seems to us in Belgium, in Elsa Belgium, like the best way to do that. And in our views, a centralized structure was the best solution to ensure our compliance. So basically, you might have several departments in your association. You might have people dealing with different things. And just by the nature of things, different people, different uh, board members, different administrators are going to deal with different uh, matters, different kind of data. Uh, you might have a secretary who's going to deal with uh, the internal management of your association. You're going to have such person dealing with such service that you offer dealing with other um, services, with other data. And so from our point of view, the easiest way to do this was indeed to create this centralized structure and to implement, to, 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 to have this new position of data protection officer. And then this person themselves is responsible uh, afterwards for drafting documents like the privacy policy, a cookie policy, the reports that Axel talked about. Uh, then the person is also responsible for making those processing evaluations. For example, we didn't mention it yet, we're going to talk about it a bit later, but one of the basis of the processing is a legitimate interest. And when you use this kind of basis, you have to uh, realize a, uh, an assessment to make a balance between your own interest and the interest of the person you deal with the, the data of. Uh, then this is also the role of the DPO, such as uh, other kind of assessments linked to the, the, the sensibility of the data. Once again, this is written uh, just under the slide, the risk, the rights and risks assessment. So the data protection officer is the central person to deal with the rights. And this is extremely important. Just imagine you're outside of the association. You want to exercise your rights. You know you have many rights under GDPR and you want to use them. What do you do? You say, okay, maybe uh, the association I was in contact with was, let's say, as a Belgium, uh, I asked for a traineeship, uh, a step traineeship with them. So what do I do? I go to uh, the person in charge of the traineeships, maybe just some officer that is maybe not even in Elsa Belgium, but from another Elsa section, the, the person doesn't really know. And the person is like, okay, I'm going to try to find the right person, etc., etc., etc. It may be very shadowy for the people to write the fine person to contact. And so with such a centralized association, uh, organization, sorry, with such a centralized structure, it's very easy for the data subjects to find the person in charge. And even if they do not find it, it's very easy for people in your association to refer to the right person, directly going to the DPO. And then the, like this, they do not need to know about everything. They just need to know who the competent person is. The, the, same, the same is uh, from the uh, other point of view, internally. Uh, because if you do not have a centralized structure, it means that you need to prepare, to train your whole teams to give them all the tips about GDPR, to teach them about data protection. And this is a huge process, a huge first, but also time consuming process and actually not very useful because what are you going to do from your people who might be dealing with a hundred of problems a day with who are very specialized in their branch, you're going to teach them some more information that they are very likely to forget because they're not going to deal with all of them every day. And because it's going to be one of their problems, it's not going to be their main concern. They might have like, let's say a hundred emails to deal with and then one about their protection. And so this email might just be forgotten or not even seen, despite its very importance. And so actually having a DPO also helps you providing the right trainings to the right people. They, all your staff does not need to know everything about data protection. They need to know what is needed. And there you make it smart. And I think this is a word we should remember when it comes to uh, GDPR compliance. Be smart in your association. Don't be time consuming. Don't think about too complex processings. You can make it very simple and very smart. And this is the idea behind it. With a central DPO, you just give the right information, the right trainings to the right people. And uh, the same way, you have one person who can do more complex operations. So you don't need to form people to deal with more complex operation. This person is just going to be able to access to uh, different branches, department of the associations or the databases and deal with those kind of processes. And I think Axel is going to agree with me on that point. A centralized structure is very often the most, uh, the smartest option you might have. It's the smartest option that you might have because it centralizes all the information, all the all the knowledge of, uh, of the in the company. And don't forget also that the DPO also have uh, contact 
with the highest level of the management. And uh, one point that I would like also to highlight from your slide, uh, Victor, is the word documents, drafting. If you know, I can give one and only advice to, uh, to people who are following us, is if they want to do a correct compliance and journey, is the point that they will have to, they will have to document each decision that they will have uh, to make. Document, document, document. You, do, you, have, you decide to appoint uh, a GPO, document this decision. If you decide to not appoint a GPO, also document this decision. If you want to have a record of processing activity, document this decision. If you want to have this kind of specific IT security measure, document this kind of, uh, of decision of ruling in your, uh, in, your doc in your company, if your uh, association. It will, it will give you uh, proof if you have a question from a uh, data subject, or also if you have question from uh, the, the data protection authority document every kind of decision that you may take regarding the gdpr is very very important and also second point on the, the, the point document it will be very useful for uh, association like as our uh, companies to write uh, policy guidelines uh, it could be a uh, policy guidelines who can access the data write uh, an access management policy uh, how you protect physically your, uh, your location, right? Uh, security uh, guidelines, who can access, who can, uh, who can delete, who can, uh, who, what will be the retention period that you will have to, to decide around your data, right? Uh, guidelines about that kind of topic. It will be, it will give you uh, more strength and it will uh, improve what, has been called under the GDPR, your accountability. The way that you can prove your compliance at any time and towards anyone. Yeah, I totally agree with Axel. And once again, let me emphasize on what he said. Documentation is important. It's not, actually it's not even important, it's central. Why do I say this? Because this is a problem that we have very often in associations. Uh, due to our structure, to the way we work, very often we have people changing very often. We do not keep our members in a very long time, very long period, especially for students' association. Which means that if you don't have a right way of drafting documents and of keeping those documents, what you do is that you lose data. Something that I see all the time in associations, and that is a terrible mistake, is that people work with their own email address, they work with their, even worse, their Facebook account, which means that this person is going to be in your association for one, two, maybe three years. And then two years later, you might need one of the documents that they dealt with, and they have it on a personal account. So first of all, you have to find the person back, contact the person back, hope that the person will respond. And then if this person responds, this per the person still has to find the document. And I hope for you, if the person still has documents. So this document drafting and document keeping is central in associations. And even before going further in the presentation, we have to tell you, please put, uh, put uh, organizations into place so that you keep your documents. This means, for example, and we're going to uh, go back, come back to this a bit later, but for example, have professional email addresses that, that uh, stay despite the, the change of birth of people have a professional email address, have a cloud that is the same for the whole association. This is a good way to ensure that you're going to keep your documents uh, and the information that you need to keep. Mm -hmm. Once again, we'll come back to this a little bit later. Uh, just before going to next point is a small example of how we did to kind of try and make it smart in Elsa, Belgium, uh, with all those obligations we had to. And especially with the, uh, the obligation of information and the obligations related to the right. Basically, what we did is just adding to our website at the very bottom of it uh, a little link towards our privacy policy and so what we call a data protection requirement form. So the privacy policy you can see on the bottom left is once again a very simple document. If you want so you can access it freely on our website, obviously. And then the other documents is one I would like to emphasize on because I think it's a good example of how you can make things smart. It's basically what we call our data protection requirement form, 
which is a document, a Google form, that any subject, any person who we have data of can just fill and send us. And then uh, we're going to have a notification of this being fulfilled and we're going to be able to come back very fast and very easily to the person. The person does not even have to find the right uh, member of the association to contact. They just go on the website, fill this form, which is extremely easy to do, and then you can deal with it efficiently and smartly. So once again, this is just an example. And of course, you don't have to copy this kind of initiatives. But this is what I would like to show you behind the idea of smart compliance. Make it simple, concrete, and efficient. And, and don't forget, Victor, that if you uh, receive that kind of data protection requirement uh, form from a data subject, that as a data controller, we have a strict timeline to reply to the data subject. The timeline is uh, 30 days. It could be extended one. But you have to inform the data subject that you will apply this extension. But so you have a strict timeline to, to reply. That, so the, all this kind of obligation of data controller, the record of the processing activity, the fact that to have a, a GPO, to have a correct awareness um, to ask its employees, uh, to have the, the correct uh, policy guidelines, it will help the company to reply in a swift and quickly manner to the to us the data subject if they receive a, uh, a question, a claim uh, from the data subject or from the, the, the data national authority. Yeah, ab absolutely. And this is what makes it so important to have this kind of smart conception of data protection. You cannot take any risk. So make it simple, make it easy, make it fast. I completely agree with you, Axel. Yeah, a mapping, a comp and full mapping of your personal data. Okay, let's move on to our next part, which is security. Axel, please. Proceed. Yeah. Um, I said earlier that it's very, very important to have uh, security and complete security measures around the personal data that you have uh, collected and do from the data subject. Because uh, don't forget that you are not, uh, uh, that is not all your personal data. You only have them for a, a short time, short term. That is very important to have uh, correct and full security measures around your personal data. Uh, the best way for you to demonstrate it to your uh, potential uh, clients, because it will be very important for you to demonstrate that towards them it, from a marketing point of view, is to have uh, uh, the ISO norm certification, the 27,000 uh, uh, regarding uh, IT security. It will be very important for you because we have trust. Again, it's only a, a question of, uh, of risk and of trust towards here the, the your potential uh, uh, clients and towards uh, the data subject. Here, uh, I like the fact that also you have to, to determine how long you will have to to keep the personal data. You cannot uh, keep the personal data for the time that you want. In case maybe uh, in uh, five years uh, you will have, uh, uh, it will be useful for you uh, again. No, it's very important for you to, to determine from the beginning, before you connect them, for how long it will be uh, necessary for you to keep the data the personal data and also to delete them after there are no more uh, necessary. If I may react on that, uh, it, it is absolutely true. And it's why, it's, as I said, think about that from the beginning, because you might want to do several things with the data and that's like, you, you might need the data, for example, to uh, the data of your members when there are members, but you might also need it to contact them if they want them to join an alumni network, for example. Then you've got to think about that from the very beginning, because if you don't do it, if you don't show the right basis, and then if you change the purpose of your processing and then the retention uh, duration uh, in May, uh, during this uh, processing, you do something which is actually not permitted. So from the very beginning, think of all possible use you will have from A to Z. The best thing is actually just 
think about what you want to do and think about the different steps, trying to figure them out, write them. And for each little step, think about what data you need and why you need it and for how long. Mm -hmm. And who can access this data that we have, we talked about that uh, previously. The last point on this slide is the, is the fact about the transfer. What is a transfer under the GDPR? Transfer is the, the processing, is the communication of the personal data to a company which is uh, located outside the EU, outside the European uh, Union. Following the GDPR is forbidden, firstly. To understand this point is, First, it's forbidden to transfer personal data outside of the EU. Only if you follow, if you have a specific, uh, a specific exception, you can do that. When can you uh, still uh, transfer personal data under the GDPR? First, look at the country. If your country has received uh, an adequate decision from given by the European Commission, you can transfer the personal data there. The, the European Commission has assessed, I think, uh, 15 or 14 countries has assessed positive, positively this uh, country uh, until now. For example, Japan, for example, some part of Canada. So you can transfer your data there. If this country, if the location is not in this country, you have to have you have to look under the gdpr if you can put in place what the gdpr called uh, uh, mechanism appropriate safeguard or if you have a specific exception to transfer the personal data one of the best known appropriate safeguard is to use the standard european contractual clause this clause has been written by the European Commission, but under the Directive on 95. So they are uh, under uh, review um, process. If you insert this uh, wording, this uh, annex of your contract, you can transfer the, the personal data outside of the EU. Also, if you have uh, the consent of the data subject, but only in specific occasion and not on a regular basis, you can transfer the personal data outside of the EU. So simply, first, the GDPR say, no, it's impossible, it's forbidden to transfer personal data outside of the EU, only on the strict condition you can do that. Either if the company's the recipient is located in a country which has been uh, positively assessed by the European Commission, meaning that this country has the same uh, level of protection that we have in Europe, or if it is not the case, you can uh, you can exert you can uh, you can have to insert some uh, other mechanism, either the standard contractual clause or even the consent, for example, of the of the data subject. If one point or again, if the country is the US, it is totally different. Uh, if, for example, you transfer your personal data outside of the EU to a company which is located in the United States, you will have to check on the privacy chain, the website, is the company is registered under the privacy chain. If the company is registered under the privacy chain, it means that this company, uh, it's mandatory for, for her to follow the, the kind, certain kind of rules that had been written, meaning the, the, the same types of rules that we have under the GDPR. It's not very uh, an adequacy decision, but it is more or less the same. So the US is very uh, a specific uh, case. Transfer possible, but under specific conditions. And once again, transfers, like sometimes uh, people think that transfer is only, once again, big data economy, only like Facebook, Amazon, whatever, who send data to servers located in California or whatever. This is not true. 
this is even, let's say, if you organize a trip, I don't know, in Cuba or if you go to Canada or whatever, when you do this, you also have to focus. This is a transfer under GDPR, which means that you have to fall under the, the, the right uh, legislative framework. Same thing. Uh, yeah, basically, uh, and this is especially important for uh, in, the, in the context of ELSA. Since we have a very specific situation, as you know, our association is located in 44 countries, some of them being part of the European economic area, some are not. And all of them are not uh, under, do not fall under some form of, um, how to say this, uh, adequacy, de adequacy decision. So once again, when you do this, you make a, a transfer of data. And so you should be cautious and think about that. Um, so this having been presented, I, I propose you to go through a step-by-step -step process of what you have to do when you want to organize a processing. But maybe if, before uh, doing this, uh, Axel, you can tell us a bit about the basis of the processing because it's a very important and central point uh, in uh, being compliant. Uh, of course, uh, when you want to do a, a processing of personal data, you cannot do that like that. You have to think about do I have a reason? Do I have a legal uh, basis to do my uh, processing? There is uh, under the GDPR, you have six uh, legal basis to do a, per a personal data processing. The most known, the famous one is the consent. But for me, consent is the weakest one of the one of the the weakest legal basis. Why? Because as I said. When a data subject gives you the authorization to process his personal data, he also has the, the right to withdraw his consent. And, and this withdrawing has to be done in an easy way. So, uh, and uh, of course, your processing is stopped. And you have to, so to choose if you can do that with another legal basis. Another one is the contract. You want to have uh, goods from uh, from from Amazon, and you enter into a contract with Amazon. You give Amazon your address, your name, your surname, and so you give the authorization. You give the contractual authorization to Amazon to uh, process your personal uh, data. The second one that we see here is the legitimate interest, a legal basis. Here, the the company. The, the association asks if if they uh, if they have the enough interest to collect the the personal data and to process them. It's not a very easy uh, legal basis because in that kind of occasion you have to to do what we call a legitimate interest assessment, a balance between the interest of the company to collect and to process the personal data against the right and freedom of the data subject to not see that its personal data have been, will be collected and processed by the company. And if the, if the interests of the companies are higher than the one of the data subject, she can collect and process the personal data. But also, if they use this legal basis, they will have, the company will have to inform the data subject, allowing him to object to this uh, uh, data processing. And again, if uh, following the, the objection, following this assessment, is right or higher, the processing has to be stopped. There are also three other legal basis under the GDPR Article 6 but I think they are uh, less useful for uh, an association like ELSA. Yeah, completely. Um, uh, as you mentioned, the three biggest bases that we are going to need as an institution are contract, legitimate interest, and consent. And whenever you're going to make a processing, this is the very first step. Let us say you organize a conference. Before think about anything else, you say, okay, what is this? On what basis am I going to collect data? And actually, very, very often as an association, what you will do, you, you can make it fall under the qualification of contract. You organize a conference, the participants are co-contractants. Same goes when you organize traineeships, for example, 
or for your members. When a person becomes a member of the association, there is a contract between them and the association. Because as you know, of course, uh, I assume that there are lots of low people in the in the assembly right now. A contract is not only something that is signed. You don't need to sign something to have a contract. It's any exchange, consensual exchange of obligation between two people. And this happens a lot of time. So once again, very, very often, contract will be your basis as an association. When it is not the case, once again, second, like the other, the three other routes, the, the three other bases that we did not talk are actually not that present in the life of, uh, of an association. I will quickly mention another one, which is, for example, allowing you to uh, comply with your legal obligations. This might be a basis for keeping a record of the different invoices that you had, because you have an obligation to keep record of the trend, the financial transfers that your association made. But so the, the, the three bases are that important. So remember, first, look if there is a contract. If not, maybe look at the other bases. And if not, very often you're going to use a legitimate interest. But once again, for this, you have to define this legitimate interest. And, and that's a very, you have, those, those are two specificities of this legitimate interest. You must make the assessment Axel talked about, and you have to communicate that interest. So it means that you cannot just rely on your privacy policy and say, okay, anyway, they have the information. No, no, no. You've got to go to the person and communicate them the legitimate interest. And this is very important. And then, and this is the last step of your thinking, and not the first, because lots of people make that mistake. They think that consent is everything, when it's actually the contrary. Consent is your last option. If you do not have any other basis, you base it on consent. So you ask, and you've got to keep a record of that. You, uh, yeah. the, 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 the state and the rest of the GDPR, for example, you should have a tick box that the person fills in to show that they gave their consent. Um, and then this is a very weak basis because indeed a person can withdraw their consent at any time. But so this is and you have and you have also to, as you said, uh, you have to have a, a record of every time that you collect the consent to prove against again against the data subject of the data national authority. You have to have a record of the consent, of the recording of the consent. Completely. So this is the first step, Once, and we're only at the first step here. So you organize something first, you sit down, you think about this basis. Once it is done, think about what your processing will be. So for example, you organize a conference, what information do you need? Or let's say uh, you go to the European Court of Justice. Oh, okay, so what do I need? I need the name, uh, first name, surname of the person, contact details to be able to contact them if needed. Oh, what do I also need? A copy of the uh, ID card because uh, the ECJ asks it, requires it to come in. So you list everything you're going to need from A to Z. So when you organize something, you have different steps. Put all those steps on the paper, all the data you're going to need. And once you have this, all the needed data, this is it. You do not process other data. You do not process more than you need. This is extremely important because sometimes in association, we have this bad habit of trying to process as many data as we can just to be able, we don't know, someday to use them because like this we're going to be able to contact the people, to send them more information, etc, etc, etc. No, but this is not how it works. You collect the data you need for a specific purpose. And that is it. And this is very important. And that's the second step. Third step, you make sure that you communicated the information. So this can be made through your privacy policy. This can be made through a direct message. Uh, very often what we do, uh, so we have a privacy policy that tells Belgium, but what we do very often is still writing a list of uh, information to the people. For example, if they have to fill a form, we give them the list of information we have to give them legally. And this is legal. We have to do this to be compliant. And this is especially important, and you cannot just rely on your privacy policy if in those cases. This is especially important in the case of a legitimate interest or of transfers, because there you really need to give this information specifically to the person. Okay, so, so once again, you might have a privacy policy. Third step anyway is to think, oh, should I give more information? Or do I have given uh, all, have I given all the needed information? For, fourth uh, step is, have you securized your staff? So the people who are going to access information, have I made it so that they are securized? Which means that you make sure that they are not going to break, to break the inform the, the, the um, the the data that they're not going to break uh, GDPR, breach GDPR. So what we do in Azerbaijan very often is 
making any person of our team to sign a non-disclosure agreement. So this is a very simple paper. You can find it on plenty of websites in which they promise that they will not uh, break any, it's, a, it's actually very broad, that can be trade secrets, etc., and that includes data that they are confronted to. And if they do not do so, you can sue them uh, for uh, very often a specific amount of money plus any damage that they would have uh, uh, made occur to you. Mm. Second thing to securize your staff is giving trainings. Just as we said before, telling them what they can and cannot do because, and you're going to see very often, breach of data, breach of uh, the GDPR are not conscious. People don't do it on purpose because, I mean, very few people want to breach GDPR on purpose. They don't want to hurt the association very often. They are just doing it uh, unconsciously. And this is why training is also important because you need your, your, your staff, you need your people to know what they can and cannot do. This way you securize your staff. Yeah, and I also wanted to highlight that, uh, again, uh, that data breach on the GDPR is very, very broad. It's a wanted data modification, but it's also a non-wanted, uh, accidental data modification. It could be done by a hacker, but also by, by accident, by one of your employees. And it is also uh, a data breach that if it is uh, really important that we have to notify to the DPA, Data Protection Authority, and also maybe to the data subject himself. Completely. And you absolutely want to avoid this because you can, like, this is very risky for you. This is really time consuming. And still, you can avoid this institution very easily. Once again, trainings, providing your people with the right information. As Axel, Axel mentioned before, having guidelines easy to understand and easy to access. Uh, but however, securing your staff, your staff is one side of uh, the securization. Another one is securing the data. And I already uh, kind of mentioned this before, but when you're going to collect, please collect in a securized way. That means do not use Facebook because in uh, associations we have this very, very bad habit of always using Facebook or social media to get information. This is bad. Do not do this. And also, try, once again, try to have a association um, or company uh, platforms, email addresses. Uh, even if you want to collect something on Facebook, do it on the Facebook account of the association, not the one of your members. Why? Because just think about that. You're going to have your member who's going to collect or let's say you have 100 members and all around the year they collect information on Facebook and then they leave. Do you know if they deleted the data? Because this is something you have to do. Once you do not need the data anymore, you have to delete it or to anonymize it. How do you know if they, do, if they did it? How do you verify it? And still, this is your responsibility. So if you do not secure it that way, you actually commit a very, very important breach. This is why I would advise any association to create specific adre email address that they would give to their members, their administrators, etc., and who would be on the cloud of the association. Uh, let's say, for example, if you create uh, Google email addresses, everything's on the shared drive of the association. This also, and this is linked with the two other points, accessibility and centralization. By doing this, you make it way easier for your data protection officer to access all the information from a central point very easily if needed. So let us say you have a requirement coming from a data subject who asks you to delete all their data. It comes to the data protection officer. What do you think is the easier? The data protection officer having to go to every single member of the association to ask them to delete the, the, the data? Or the data protection officer who from his own account can just access all the account of all the association and delete the data directly. I mean, I think this is clear. So those are ways to secure the data, the data. And once again, it's very easy, just providing the proper trainings from the one person who is really competent, making them sign NDAs when they become members and having an, an association cloud, an association platform. Yeah, and don't forget that the securitization, the security around the data, it has to happen from the beginning of the collection, when you transfer, when you communicate the, the, the data, and until the deletion of the data. At trust, at action, there are several uh, time timeline in the with the what that, what action that you could do with the with the data when there are 
I think about also the structure that the difference between the structured data and the unstructured data. Unstructured data are uh, common uh, emails. In emails, you have also uh, most of the time personal data. And so these emails also have to be protected and after a certain point of time, deleted. Absolutely. Uh, after that, what comes? Well, you have your, you, you know how you're going to make your processing. You have securized your stuff. You are collecting the data. What happens next? You must ensure that you have a correct framework to let the people exercise their rights, as we said. And once again, very easy. Just make an accessible way. Just uh, open the way. Uh, for example, as we, as we showed you before, by creating a form that is accessible from your website. This is a very easy way or just by making sure that uh, informing the people that they can contact your data protection officer and putting like uh, highlighting the email address of the data protection. This must be very easy to do. Uh, preventing breaches and if there are some, like, so as we said with trainings, etc. and if there are some, making sure that the people go directly to the data protection officer. So you must, you must ensure that all your staff when they're gonna notice a breach, they first know what a breach is, and secondly, make sure that your data that they go directly to the right person. That being said, this means your data protection officer. So they have to know who to go to easily, directly, which means you've got to be very accessible. Uh, and also, if the person does not see it, you need, and this is gonna be linked with uh, the last point, you need as a data protection officer sometimes to make checkups to see, to, to try to see what breaches could have been committed. And then I'm gonna put the last points together. Once all this is done, you have used the data as you said you did, this comes to the end of the processing. You have either to anonymize it or to delete it. Delete it means completely deleting it from any place it might have been. This can be any single mailbox of your association, any single drive of your association. And if you did not respect the previous points, any single private account of your members or anonymization. And that, there is a very high understanding of that, which means that the person can not be like in no way recognizable anymore. And what I would advise you to do, because if you respect this, you have a very low chance. Like if you respect all those small steps that we gave you, you have a very low chance to uh, commit strong breaches, but still you might have some little chances. And to minimize those, what we would advise you to do are regular checkups. Go regularly through your whole database to see what information you still have, why you still have it. You might find some surprises, um, once again, some human mistakes. You, very often people do not want to commit a breach, but they do it uh, just humanly. By accident, by accident. By ac exactly. So checkups allow you just to ensure that you do not suffer from those human accidents. Okay, so we're now moving to our next point, which is some topical questions we wanted to talk about, some very specific questions that, some, that people very often ask. The first being, do I need a DPO? Well, Axel, I think the answer is no, but you should. <laughs> you should. Oh, you shouldn't. It's uh, depending the case, depending the company, the association, the answer could be different. Following the under the GDPR, a DPO is not uh, is not mandatory by itself. Even if it is not mandatory for you, you could choose to appoint one. But if you appoint a real DPO, the name DPO, the code, the name of the function DPO, you will have to follow all the obligation of the GDPR. It's a mandatory for association or company in uh, three uh, specific uh, cases. If the company do regular uh, data processing and on a large scale, it's very, very broad, you will have to appoint a DPO. If a company is a public institution, they will have also to appoint a DPO. And also if they uh, process what we call the sensitive uh, data, they will also to appoint uh, a DPO. But my advice is, is, uh, is to appoint a DPO, someone in charge of the of the dealing with the data protection regulation, because nowadays it's more and more important. If you don't follow that kind of issue, you will be in breach sooner or later. Exactly. So 
Uh, next question is, do I need a privacy policy? So this is actually very funny because I see the two sides uh, very often. You either have people who say that they have a privacy policy because it's important, everybody has one, but they don't really know why they have it. They just make it. And then you have people saying, oh, no, actually, I'm, I'm too small. I'm a small organization. Once again, I don't need that. So it's actually interesting to know why you need a privacy policy. What is the idea behind? What is the point? Once again, we told you, you have legally to communicate a series of information to any data subject. They must be able to access it. So that can be who the data controller is, who your DPO is, what is the purpose of the processing, how long you keep it, the list of rights that they have, etc., etc., etc. And actually, a privacy policy is just a way for you to have a general document telling generally how you deal with data which does not mean that you do not have to further communicate sometimes. Once again, for example, as you have a legitimate interest or transfers or whatever, but this makes it easier so that if sometimes you do not communicate those information, people can still find it easily, let's say on our, on your website. So of course you, so the answer is no, you do not need a privacy policy. It's not mandatory. You can decide just for every small processing to ensure that you're going to uh, write a whole text to each person and, and and be sure that you're not going to commit any mistake and always communicate it you can do this but well i think it's safer for you to have one because this is actually not that complicated if you just record your whole your your data processing your different activities you can very easily write a privacy policy which is going to secure you and ensure an easy compliance and don't forget to, to write this privacy uh, policy if you decide to write one in an easy way, in a very simple world, not with uh, scientific uh, expressions, but you have to also to be uh, complete. You have to, 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 to strictly follow the, the GDPR. Under Article 13 and 14, you will find all the information that we have to, to put to add in a privacy policy. It's sometimes very, very long, but you will have to write it in a smart way, in a very easy way. This is sometimes very complex. All right. So next question, Axel, tell us, do you need, do, do we need as an association a record of processing activities? For, uh, for me, for, for following the, 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 the GDPR, uh, if your association has less than uh, 250 uh, employees, it's not mandatory to, to have, to, to do a, a record of your processing activities. But if the processing that you do uh, could bring a risk to the right and freedom of the data subject, you will have to, to write and to fulfill uh, a record. But nevertheless, it's very, uh, very easy to write one. And it will be a proof of your uh, accountability towards the data subject. and towards the, the data protection authority. So it's not very uh, it's not very complex, it's not very difficult to write one. And it will give you the opportunity, the opportunity to have a large overview and a complete overview of what you do with personal data inside of your association. In a very easy document, we will have a complete overview. Especially since I think that making your privacy policy or record of processing activities can be done in parallel and actually they're linked yeah. together. So if you make one, it's kind of a nonsense not to make the other one. Totally. Uh, okay, so next point, how do I, how to ensure that my social media are compliant? So in my opinion, there are two sides to this question. Uh, your social media, this can mean all the messages that you have. And so once again, you might have data in there. So you just have to submit them to all the rules we talked before. If you collected data this way, what was your basis? Uh, did you minimize the collecting, etc., etc., etc.? And more importantly, most importantly, don't forget to anonymize or delete. So this, I'm not gonna go longer about that because this is actually what we talked about for a long time. What is more interesting is the other part. Because as associations, we use social media very often as a way to promote ourselves, to market us. And the fact is that we use a lot of pictures. And something that people forget very often is that pictures are data because they make people recognizable. They, they allow for the recognition of the person, which means that they also have to be submitted to the rules of GDPR. So don't get me wrong. 
it does not mean that you have to go right now to rush on your computer and just delete all the pictures that you have. No, it means that if you want to use it properly, you have to get it properly. You have to ensure that you collect those pictures on a, a legal basis, that you uh, inform the people of the purposes, and then that you keep the info. Uh, and then, of course, you can keep them very long. If it's for your promotion, you need sometimes data for a very long term. GDPR is not about not keeping information for a long period. It's just making sure that they, uh, their, their basic aim, the basic aim of the processing is to keep them for a long period. And then to allow the people to have their information deleted if they want so. So they can come to you and say, okay, I don't want my, uh, my pictures anymore. Let's say, oh, I want you to take off this picture, this picture, this picture. When it comes, of course, basically about privacy. So yeah, mm -hmm. when it comes to your social media, those are the two important points. Uh, and then there are three other uh, very typical questions that are more related to Elsa that I wanted to talk about because of the very specific structure of our association. And because I know that some of the people who are watching us right now are from uh, Elsa. So first, what about the international programs of Elsa? So uh, some of you might not know, but Elsa is divided in three big layers. The first one being the international level, who is competent for all 44 countries the national levels in each country and local levels in each university. And as international puts into place some international programs that aim at, at being uh, offered to all the students in the entire network and sometimes even further to students from outside of the network. And in putting those programs into place, for example, our traineeship program step, we, um, well, the different layers have to work together. And even if the information is basically collected by Elsa International, then all like the national level and the local level also have access to those data, have to work on it to modify them, etc., etc., etc. And so the fact is that even if we have a clear uh, d uh, different competences when it comes to this, it seems a bit unsure to me on what the actual uh, status of those data is when you deal with them. Do you deal as a separate entity and then as a national uh, entity, as a local entity, which means that there is a transfer, obviously, with you, towards you? Or uh, are you actually an organ of Verza International? Do you act as an agent of Verza International? And the question, the question behind it is, which principles, which rules should you apply when you do this? Do you apply your own privacy policy? Do you apply that of Verza International? And that's a clear difference because if Verza International says we keep those data for four years and you say I keep them for two years, what do you do, right? And so my advice when it comes to the international programs of Verza, so of course there are the summer schools, or this is uh, the STEP program, is be as compliant as you can. Follow the, str the most strict privacy policy, the most strict rules. You will never be punished for being too compliant. And if uh, both are kind of similar, I would give uh, the priority to the one of Elsa International. This is the first thing. And then uh, second thing is maybe more focusing on the different departments of Elsa. As you know, uh, as the ideas as the members know, we divide our session between supportive areas, which are BEE, so the president, IM, which is the international manage, uh, the internal management dealt by the secretary, financial management, and marketing, and then key areas which are actually organizing more concrete activities. So um, we shouldn't make the mistake of thinking of as a as a uh, as one big block that should be so, uh, submitted to the same rules uh, for different departments. We should be aware, aware of the very difference of each department. It's especially important for the supportive areas because each supportive area uh, organizes very different processing. For example, BEE, so the president is in charge of looking for sponsors, which means that very often you're going to be under uh, the basis of contract with all the rules that come behind. When, however, I am, so the sec secretary general is in charge of internal management, dealing with the team, but also with the alumni. So you're, you have to know how to deal with the information for each of them. And same goes with marketing, with the special uh, rules for the social media and FM, financial management, for the, um, with the special rules to also apply. For example, the specific fact that we are legally binded, uh, bound to keep uh, um, a record of the invoices for a certain amount of time, which means that we have to use a certain basis that we don't use in other circumstances. 
when it comes to the key areas, very often you are very likely to fall under the qualification of a contract because indeed you organize activities and people go to those activities. So they kind of consent to a contract with you. There, I would say that the risk, and this is where you should focus more if you work on in a, either in AA, MCC, SNC or STEP, you should focus more on um, minimization of data. You should be sure that any data that you use is really a data that you need. So once again there, just draw a line of the, and put, put in it the different steps of your processing from A to Z, and for each of them, think about what you need. So yeah, that, that was maybe kind of repeating a bit what we said, but I think it was important just to see the different risks that you have. If you're a sportive area, be very prudent on the bases that you use because they are very different from what we usually do. So you might have very specific crews. If you're more of a key area, of course, pay attention to the basis of the processing, but moreover, be very prudent when it comes to the minimization of data and the, the range of data that you um, deal with. So I see a question of Gao. However, Gao, there will be a Q&A session. Uh, so I, uh, I would invite you to keep your question for when we're going to open it, which is uh, very soon. Uh, <laughs> then I give the floor for, uh, to Axel for uh, the last point of our presentation, which is data protection governance framework. Thank you, thank you, Victor. Yes, uh, last slide is about how to deal uh, with the GDPR uh, as a real journey, not as a goal as itself. I mean that uh, to be compliant is not, uh, I, I want to be uh, compliant uh, in two months, so I hire uh, a GPO, I do my documentation, I, I buy some uh, IT tools and that's it. No, it's not, it's not that the GDPR. When you do uh, a correct data protection journey, first of all, you assess where you are, what are your gaps towards the, your obligation from the GDPR. Of course, you will find some gaps because uh, before uh, appointing a, a GPO, it was not mandatory. Having a record of the processing uh, activities, it was not uh, mandatory. So you analyze your company, you assess your company and you write what you have to do. You do a legal assessment. Phase two is you implement the solution to cover your gap. You, uh, you write the, the guidelines, you do uh, trainings towards your employees, uh, and you buy, you implement the IT tools to secure the personal data that you collect and, uh, and process. Firstly, you do uh, a regular, uh, regularly uh, assessment of what you are what you did uh, i advise to do that uh, yearly you ask uh, every uh, line of business every uh, department what have, what what were the modification of, of last year do we have to uh, update our record of the processing activities did we update our data breach uh, record do we uh, have to update of uh, our consent record, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So you you see what happened in the year uh, before, and and you implement and you uh, complement what you did previously. If you see from your uh, assessment that there are still some gap, or is uh, or if some gap appear. You have to cover these new gaps in implementing a new uh, IT tools, in uh, updating your your record, in uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you you see that uh, to be compliant is not a goal, it's not an objective in itself. It has to be done uh, all the year. GDPR has to be implemented in the structure, in the infrastructure of your uh, company, in uh, your association in uh, asking in asking a question to the dpo in uh, opening a mailbox a dpo mailbox for example for the that are subject but also for the employees of your uh, association of your uh, of your company then we have the opportunity to ask him a regular question that could uh, that they could have uh, day on a daily basis 
Compliance is a journey, it's not purely an objective, it's not an end, it's a never ending story. And that it is this slide is a, some kind of a justification uh, draw of what I, what I just said. It's a, a never ending journey, but it's a very interesting journey. Exactly. I think you couldn't phrase it better. Like uh, GDPR is, uh, uh, the data protection story is very much about getting good habits more than just, you know, completely changing the way you act as an association or a company or whatever. Just implement those few good habits in, your, in the way you work and you're going to be compliant very, very easily. So yeah, compliance being a journey to goal is, I think, uh, that, that this is a, probably, I think, the motto of all data protection officers and data protection practitioners. Uh, okay, now let's move on to the Q&A session. Uh, I will open uh, the question mode, which means that you can highlight your questions. For those who follow us on Facebook, if you want to ask the questions, I invite you to click on the link that was shared earlier in this day on the, uh, on the Facebook events and you're going to be able to access to the click meeting uh, conference where you can ask the questions. We're only going to take the questions on the click meeting portal. I see people typing. Uh, Gao, if you want, so I would invite you to re put your question uh, on the, okay, perfect. Oh, okay. Mm. So the first question of Gao is, would separate data protection guidelines be advisable per area? So this is, I suppose, for ELSA or outside of ELSA, depending on the activities, per sort of activity, or is it too extensive? Uh, well, Axel, do you want to answer this one? I will have things to say afterwards, but if you want to... Uh, I think that this highlights the fact that to have a guideline, to have clear awareness of, uh, about the GDPR, and what are your obligations, do we have to appoint a GPO, do we have to have a record of processing, uh, or can we uh, reply to the data subject? It's very, very important. The, these guidelines have to be, uh, from following me, uh, written, could be uh, per, per area, it means per country. Do you think? Excuse me, you mean for Elsa? Yeah. What, uh, what do Gao mean per area? Uh, I think per area is the different areas of Elsa. So, step, uh, BEE, uh, financial management. So this is more for department, I think. Uh, since the GDPR is an European uh, regulation, so directly applicable uh, with all its terms in all the European countries, you can do that per area. If the area are the same for all the countries, one for uh, gu uh, guidelines for marketing department, one guideline for uh, finance and department could be great because marketing are always the same in all the countries. No, I couldn't phrase it better. I think the idea here, once again, is making it smart. Sm so, simple. Smart and simple. So, for example, I think, indeed, like, first of all, when having guidelines is absolutely necessary. We never have too many guidelines because this actually helps us understanding better how to be uh, compliant in a good way. Uh, however, in the context of ELSA, I think we should make it smart as well. When we have international programs, for example, the, let's, let's think about that. The data has been process, processed from A to Z for the same purpose. And for the, from the, the eyes of the data subject, it's gonna, it's gonna be, the objective is going to be the same. He knows from the beginning how the data will be dealt with, and they are being processed for one purpose. So I think we would win in fulfilling all, all of us under the same privacy policy. However, it's a bit too far saying that we would have the same guidelines or privacy policy for each area of Elsa. Why? Because still, we, are, we have different activities, different ways of working in different countries. So for those uh, activities, for those areas where we still are different, I don't think we should have common privacy policies, area uh, guidelines, sorry, or whatever in Elsa. However, I think indeed we would win a lot in having common rules for international programs, or at least for things that are so similar that we should actually be similar on the way we, we act, on the way we do, on the way we deal with data, indeed. Mm -hmm. So what, uh, what other questions do we have? We have Gao precising her questions. I think we answered it, if I'm not wrong. If not, Gao just uh, says something else about that. I have a very 
nice comment from a <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you very much i couldn't have, I agree more <laughs> and then we have one from william alexandre toublon uh who watches us i think from luxembourg and who asks how to prepare a future dpo in as a group more specifically if he she is a low student uh do you want to talk about that or oh, but can I, I can talk about my uh, experience i am a dpo of a financial uh, startup uh what i did is uh there's there are uh, trainings done at solver at university uh, in belgium and i think also in other in other country following the gdpr you don't have to have a, a specific uh, certification um it's a, it's a specific paper but uh, you have to have a deep knowledge of the uh, regulation uh so it could be a challenge to uh to do that at the same time but why 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 not huh? uh oh yeah indeed like if i may talk about my experience actually i think the very first step is indeed knowing about gdpr like this is the heart of the framework in belgium so just take the regulation at first and read it in a very conscious way. I mean, we are in you know, a low student, so you have uh, the good formation, the good education to actually understand it to some, some extent. And then we have lots of resources, you know, lots of books, lots of articles that have been written. So I think the first step, the very first step is reading. Then prepare yourself by uh, have, uh, like listening to conferences, to listening to courses. And I think the ultimate step that we should try and develop more and more in Elsa in the future would be having uh, data protection partnerships just as it's done at the international level. So uh, of course, all of us cannot be specialized in data protection because we are still students, but we might have already train ourselves, educate ourselves, and then having a resource person to go to, to ask more information. And uh, if we have some very specific and uh, sensitive act, um, uh, actions to take, uh, a person towards who we could uh, turn ourselves. Mm -hmm. I see Ines Gamito, sorry if I don't pronounce it very well. What advice do you have for a compliant Google Drive or any sort of online storage? GDPR applied to personal data collected before the GDPR. Uh, I can reply, but I will apply it. I will reply firstly the second question. Yeah, the GDPR is applied to personal data collected before the GDPR if you continue your, uh, your processing. But for example, if you have uh, personal data that you have collected before the entry into force uh, in May, uh, in two years ago, you have to uh, to reassess your collection and to, to do it in a more regular, uh, compliant way. Now, you have to, uh, yeah, to do your assessment now. What you do now have to be compliant with the GDPR. And what advice do you have to follow Towards uh, Google Drive and uh, any sort of uh, online uh, cloud storage is very uh, is very difficult uh, because uh, against the GAFAM you can do nothing. It's uh, only click uh, and you have to ac to accept uh, their uh, service condition. But I think Google Drive and the, the other one are compliant because they are uh, under the privacy chain they apply under the privacy chain you can transfer your data in the towards uh, google and i think you can be sure that they are uh, they are put in place in place a uh, good uh, it uh, security measures but again uh, they are subject to the cloud act remember what i said about the, the code act so if you are uh, a company dealing with uh, confidential financial information it's very sensitive uh, personal uh, data think twice maybe and if you have a financial institution it's also uh, you are also to deal with the guidelines of the national bank the belgian national bank uh, it will be an outsourcing. You will have to follow uh, the outsourcing uh, rules of the BNB. So it's very difficult to be compliant with the, the GAFAM, but it's not uh, it's not impossible. No, and also like when you this is a question of security of the data, 
So when you do this, actually, you have ex they they say that they are compliant. They respect GDPR. They have a privacy policy for this. They they are placed under the privacy shield. So actually, from your point of view, they are being compliant. And so if there is a breach of security of data, this is not that much your responsibility as long as you don't know that such a mm. big risk exists today. So you are not being uncompliant by doing that. But remember the Cambridge Analytica uh, issue. Uh, you never know what they will do if you uh, with your own data and they are in the US. So we have, if you want to follow, to sue them, you will have to do that there. Uh, so uh, it's, it's possible. Advisable is another question. So next question comes from our, French, our friend Francesco. If I am going to register my company, but I have not done it yet, can I use Google Form to do market research without asking personal data, such as mail or personal information? I mean, just asking uh, anonymous information. If yes, shall I put a policy in the form and which are the legal base in this case? So once again, we're going to, and we're coming back from the very beginning of the presentation. The GPR is applicable when you process data of European citizens or when you direct your information towards citizens in the European Union in order to process their data. But if you do not process data or if you do it in an anonymous enough way, then indeed you do not, like, you, you fall under GDPR, of course, but you do not fall under the requirement of deleting the data, deleting the rights uh, to the people because they are not recognizable anymore and those are not data in the sense of the GDPR anymore because there is strict the, the definition is pretty strict. It's in Article 4A, I think, of the regulation, which says a data is any information about a person that makes that person recognizable. So if it's completely anonymous, just ask, okay, what's your preference when it comes to this, when it comes to that, when it comes to that, in a way that does not obviously allow you to identify the person, you actually don't need to uh, go through this whole process we've been presenting before. Exactly. Exactly. The next question is from Stefan Zeman, who uh, writes us from Austria, if I'm not wrong. <laughs> what would be your best practice proposal when dealing with data subject rights, especially regarding the reasonable doubt as it is undefined in the GDPR, although it's, from my point of view, a central term when it comes down to exercising data subject rights? What information would you ask from the data subjects, and when do you see ah, okay. reasonable doubt about the identity of a data subject? You see the question, Victor, is uh, the fact that when you receive a, a question from a, a data subject, sometimes it's easy to recognize who is asking the question, but sometimes it's not so easy to recognize uh, the person behind the, que behind the question. So if you have reasonable doubts towards uh, this uh, person, you may ask more information. You can ask, for example, a copy of his uh, ID. So directly asking for a copy of an ID is not advisable, it's even forbidden. But only if you have a reasonable dogs uh, of the identity of the people behind the question, you can ask a copy of his, uh, of his ID. Completely, and if I may say, this actually, so when you're gonna ask more information, you're gonna actually process more information. So you're just gonna have to go through the whole process once again. So why do I process this? This might be a legitimate interest that you have to ensure that the person is actually the person uh, who they ask information of. And so you have a perfect interest of asking this uh, copy of the ID or maybe have a picture or whatever, or more information about them. So this just go through the whole process. And I think indeed, mm -hmm. Having a copy of the ID is very often a good way to identify the person. If you have doubts about the identity. If you have doubts. If you have put in place uh, a tool of a, a process that allows you to directly recognize the, the people, like having a copy of the identity card, identity card is not advisable. If not, if you have doubt, you can ask for a copy. But don't keep this copy, again, uh, too long. If you if you are certain about the identity, delete and uh, the the copy of the person of the identity card right after. So next question comes from Ibrahim, who asks, "Do you think as international should have a DPO two and why?" So I think this is kind of 
going out of the scope of this uh, process of this uh, webinar sorry and uh, i don't think i have to give direct like my, my opinion about how international deals with their activity however as a general uh, uh, generally i would say it is always better to have a dpo whatever position they, they may occupy internally you whatever the position they they have inside but having a dpo data protection officer is always a plus and i think it's becoming a necessity today. So do I think as international have a DPO? I think any any company in the association should have a DPO, whatever layer they are at. And why? Once again, just because of the of the whole presentation, because this is the best way to ensure easily, concretely, and simply uh, that you are being compliant without having to give a whole training to every single person in your, in your team. Um, we have a question directly to you, Mr. Balin. Do you think that it would be necessary to have a technology engineering background to possibly practice IP TMT law in the future? Is Axel still here? Can other people still hear me or is... Ah, ah, uh, it was frozen for uh, oh, okay. two or three minutes. Okay, good, ah, you're back. Yes, this is directly for you. Okay, maybe the part the attendees can tell me if this is Mr. Billen who is frozen or if it's me. Just a clarification. Just Mr. Billen. Okay, so maybe let's keep this question for later. Uh, you are listening to me. This is a pleasure. So, uh, I see uh, my actual favorite member of Elsa, Matthew and Boxing Bird, saying that uh, the webinar was insightful. And I thank you very much, Matthew. This is uh, very hard. Thank you. <laughs> I'm back. A... And this uh, it was frozen again. Person. It was frozen again. So, are you back now? Yeah, it was frozen again. But okay, I'm back. Okay, so this was the question. Uh, that was directed directly to you. Ah, okay. Uh, it's not necessary. It could be very uh, helpful because you have to know a little bit more and more uh, about uh, technology, IT, informatica, and so on. So uh, if you like this kind of subject, knowing more about how to uh, secure the personal data, how to deal with them, you know, you have to know a little bit more about uh, IT, about the, the IT, the different IT tools, and also how to uh, to communicate with the IT department of the association of the of the company, because uh, with the GDPR, two uh, two different kind of people and contents. The IT guys and the, the law guys have to meet uh, each other and to communicate. Uh, more and more, for example, to to write a correct and full DBIS data protection impact assessment, you will have to gather the IT, the the, the legal guy, the business guy, and so on. So uh, having a good knowledge about this kind of area, a large overview, not a, a specific uh, knowledge, could be very uh, very helpful. Okay, uh, I don't see any other question at the moment. So if you have if some others maybe let's uh we're gonna let you a few more seconds uh but if i may also just give my my views on the question i think anyway in the law world you need to know about anything because law is related to plenty of different fields and domains but this is impossible so i think something you shouldn't forget is that everybody has got their special spe specialization uh, their, their their specific knowledge and so you need to cooperate with them very often and maybe in the field of an exactly. association, I would say, uh, I would also advise any association today to have an IP team, uh, an IP team, an IT team, sorry, uh, and to be able to work with them uh, and to cooperate with them. So I saw some people yeah. typing, but I don't, ah, we have a new, another question from, let's see, ah, uh, yeah. the DPO should be yeah, independent. Good one. How is this requirement fulfilled in Elsa if the DPO is a member of the board, a deputy, <laughs> or a director? Well, this is actually a very, very good question. 
But uh, the independence of the data protection officer in ELSA is, I think, if I'm, uh, actually you may uh, implement on this if I'm wrong, but we do not take an active place in any processing that is made, in anything that the association do. Our role in ELSA is to give information, is to uh, have a place in any processing that we make to give an information about that. Afterwards, indeed, the very specific position of the DPO may being sometimes a board member was a problem at the beginning, and we had this question, and we had to answer that question. Uh, however, the, the fact is that the DPO does not take an active place in uh, con advising to process information that we not advise, okay, do such or such processing. We do not have this uh, monitoring position. We have an advisory position. The role of the DPO, and this is reflected in our statutes, is to deal with data protection in the association and to advise in the association. But as such, we do not monitor um, activities. And this is where the conflict of interest would be. If you were the controller and the controlled at the same time. So for example, if at some point I was uh, deciding to, I don't know, make a, a, a band camp about data, about, uh, data protection, and I had to collect information myself and to control myself. But the fact is, at no moment the DPOs, uh, at least I can talk for Azerbaijan, of course, but at no moment the DPO is the one I am, con uh, I am controlling. I never control myself. I always control what my board members, my co-board members do. And I think, I don't know if you have something to say about that, Axel, but I think this is the idea behind the notion of conflict of interest. Yeah, and I can... Uh... I can, I can also advise to, to, to read the, the recent uh, ruling uh, from the, the Belgian DP, DPA. It will be published in French in the, in the week to come. It's uh, only available in, uh, in Dutch, but it was the, the case for the company, a conflict of interest between the, the, the DPO and the, manage, the manager of the audit risk and in compliance um, department, and this highlighted in the ruling that being in, in the business, being the supervisor, the supervisor is not advisable. Okay, and we're gonna take a last question because we're running out of time, which is also from William Alexton. How to be sure that the rules of an ELSA group, that an ELSA group has written in order to be compliant with the GDPR are correct on a legal point of view? Well, and this is where I, I'm saying it again. I would advise you to have a uh, uh, data protection partner at some point so that this person, you can submit them uh, what you did and the person can advise you because they are professionals, so they probably know more about that than we do. And then it's always possible to ask authorities to uh, give their opinion about what you did. Totally, you you're totally correct. Go to them and ask them if you're uh, being compliant. Totally correct. Now, I know that the Belgian DPA will launch uh, in the weeks to come uh, around tables for GPOs to uh, allowing you to ask questions directly to them uh, during a, a lunch, uh, during a, a meeting. And uh, I know also that in France, the CNIL, the French GPA, is, uh, you can contact them very easily. They are paid to serve us. <laughs> Oh, don't don't uh, don't forget. Okay, and we're not closing the. Don't hesitate. Don't oh, hesitate. sorry. So we're not closing. Don't the... hesitate to contact. Oh. <laughs> I think we're talking at the same time. Uh, so I'm not closing the Q and A session, and just before uh, ending the presentation, I would like to thank all of you for being present, having followed this webinar, and I would like to give a special thank to uh, Axel. Your 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 advice were really inspiring and precise and they helped Thank us. You. Uh, I think they helped me and I think they're going to help all the people who watched this webinar. Uh, maybe you I can hope, say a so. bit more about what you do at IP News and especially uh, you can talk about your book for the the people who speak French in the assembly. This is Guide Pratique du RGPD, which I myself strongly advise as being a very, very precise, concrete. It, what What is impressive with that book is that it is extremely concrete it's just a whole process of how what you have to do it's you don't even have to think just have to follow the process that axel wrote for you uh, for any question that is uh, that might be asked to you in your in your practice and this is really impressive with that book so maybe Axel, you thank can you thank you give more information about oh. your practice there um my here i don't uh, i had my uh, my email if you want to ask them. 
some question. And my book was uh, published by uh, a Belgian uh, publisher, Broiland, uh, one year or two uh, ago. I, I wrote about the GDPR in some kind of features, some notes about one topic and explain uh, topic by topic in the in this book. It's a very useful book. I think I receive a lot of uh, compliments about the book. Thank you. And uh, I'm about to maybe to, to write uh, an update in one year or two years ago. My publisher will be happy. Uh, and if you want, you can uh, still also follow me uh, on Twitter. I regularly tweet uh, GDPR, blockchain, and, uh, and legal, uh, legal tweets. Uh, and I also uh, comment the, the news on LinkedIn. Um, also very active and uh, with uh, IP News and other uh, partners, I organize uh, seminars uh, about uh, GDPR and about uh, the news, about legal news. I did uh, four, uh, four seminars at the BC in Brussels. Thank you for them. And so I'm available for you at any time if you have uh, if you have a question. And uh, I was very happy to participate to the, to to deal with this uh, topic. I like uh, I like uh, a lot, and I follow uh, I follow a lot. It's not it's very uh, difficult to follow the, the GDPR GDPR nowadays. Why? Because it is an urban regulation. What happened in in Poland, or in Austria, or in the UK? could have an impact on uh, your uh, activities. It could be uh, the beginning of an argumentation for a Belgian lawyer. So you have to, to have a clear overview of what happened in, uh, in all the European uh, country. And thanks of LinkedIn, for example, it's uh, easier than, than before. And uh, so I am available for you if you have a question uh, in, the, in the future. And, Thank you, you, Victor, uh, for your kindness and your, uh, your availability. It was very, uh, very, I was very happy to help you. Well, that was Thank a pleasure you. for me to work with you. I really appreciate it as well. And uh, I, I hope that you know what you're doing. If you tell people, they can come with questions to you because I think have <laughs> a whole range of questions. Don't forget that you have feelings. Okay. Uh, so to conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. I see this question of Francesco. Uh, if we can share the slides, of course, we will share them on uh, our the Facebook. You have my content. <laughs> <laughs> we had the content of, any, of everybody. You might go see this. <laughs> so we're going to uh, send the, um, the slides on Facebook. We're going to share them on the Facebook of the events, not the one of, as a Belgium. So go on the event itself. And this uh, webinar, as I said in the thing, has been recorded. So if at some point you might want it to be shared with you for training purposes, that was also the idea of making it in English because we want it to be, uh, we want to be able to share it with uh, our Elsa sections in Belgium since we, you know, we work in several languages, but I don't think it would be a problem for any of us to share it with other sections. Axel, I don't know if you see a problem with that. Okay. And Dorian, my dear Francesco. <laughs> Uh, and the recording is on the <laughs> Facebook page as well as Lucas says. I think it's now time for us to say goodbye to all of you. I now, if uh, as you can see, maybe it appeared on your page. For more information on GDPR, you can just click on the link and you will see an amazing website, the one of our uh, partner, <laughs> IP News, and I strongly advise you to go there. I thank, thank you, you all, and I thank you, uh, Axel, once again, and I wish you all a great 1st of May and uh, a great weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, see you next time. Bye.